Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number five of Cities and Urban Land Use, unit number seven of AP Human Geography. Let's begin. Tonight we're going to start out with a little bit of review. We're going to go back to unit number six, Industrialization and Economic Development, and we'll review the difference between basic and non-basic industries. Now, for our purpose tonight, we want to look at it as it's uh, how it impacts cities. So basic industries, this is something you're going to want to make a little special note of. S basic industries are city forming or city growing industries. These are the ones that, that really have a big impact on the city itself. So good examples, steel in Pittsburgh, automobiles in Detroit, uh, technology in Silicon Valley. Granted, that's not a specific city, but it's a group of cities and technology, very important, all of them. Uh, so let's review and, and bring it back to the local. For our local community in Las Vegas, what would be our basic industry? So make a mental, make a, a note of that. And then on the flip side, we've got non-basic industries. These are our city serving industries. So these are going to be where most of our services are going to come in. So you're going to get things like banks, grocery stores, construction crews, things like that. Uh, I want you to try and come up with two additional non-basic industries, industries that sell their products primarily to consumers within a local community. So two different examples there. Now, again, this should be reviewed, but which basic or non-basic produces more jobs? And hopefully you remember that this is called the multiplier effect. And the multiplier effect says that for every one basic job, that we create. There are two to four, and depending on who you talk to, the number varies, uh, jobs in the non-basic area that are created. So that's that's the difference, and that's once again called the multiplier effect. Want to know that, and, and know the ratio, one to two to four. Um, now, non-basic jobs tend to form the city's tax base. What we mean by that is because there are more non-basic jobs, again, we have to differentiate. Jobs are produced because of basic industries and growth in basic industries. But most of the jobs end up being non-basic jobs. So that's where a lot of the tax revenue within a city is going to come from. And for public services, we're talking education, uh, public transportation, police, fire, de uh, fire departments, those types of things. That's typically going to be money that is coming from a city or some kind of municipality. And where they get that money from is typically tax revenue. And so a lot of that tax revenue is coming from non-basic jobs. Now this does or can present an issue, particularly in low income areas, uh, which again, as we talk about our different models, typically tends to be closer to our central business district. Now let's, we'll, we'll give a, a real life example so we can see how this plays out. Let's take, for example, the city of Detroit which is the largest municipality to declare bankruptcy in the United States. Uh, first off, what is its basic industry? And we just reviewed that should be automobiles. And are, is this still the major automobile manufacturer in the United, uh, United States? And the answer is no. Those jobs have started to move elsewhere, particularly domestically, they've moved to the south. So as those basic jobs move to the south, same multiplier effect here, but it works in reverse. For those jobs leaving, we don't need as many services. I mean, this is this is central place theory. This is rank size rule. So those jobs leave as well. That tax revenue leaves, which then means that you have less money to pay for those services. And so when you start dividing up where the municipalities are, we've got the central city and then you've got the outlying suburbs. Well, the outlying suburbs, they're still going to have those services, but then that central city tends to lose a lot of those services. And that's something that we'll talk about in the next lecture. Now, cities that are founded or grow dramatically because of a basic industry don't remain that way forever. Uh, Detroit's a great example right now. We're seeing a lot of those automobiles shift to the south. Pittsburgh, same kind of thing built on steel manufacturing no longer is necessarily uh, the biggest city in terms of that. And those are examples of deindustrialization. Um, university towns that start out because they have a university there continue to grow over time and start to diversify. 
uh, mining towns, a uh, great example, bringing it back to our local state, uh, Virginia City. It was a boom town, huge mining industry, and that left. The mine closed up and people were out of jobs, and so they had to, to readjust. And A lot of people moved elsewhere. Uh, if you've ever been to Virginia City now, uh, you, you can see the mine, but uh, really because it's more of a tourist attraction. So these types of things change over time and cities diversify. And so we start to see other jobs, other services come into play. Um, and as cities grow or shrink based on central place theory, we know they're going to have more or less services as a result. Now, there's other factors at play here. For example, we have to mention immigration. Let's review Ravenstein's laws of migration. There were seven of them. I would like you to review all seven of those because uh, as we prep for the AP exam, now's the time that we want to start making connections to other areas. And Ravenstein is a really big one when it comes to understanding migration. So go back, take a look at those seven laws of migration. And if you don't remember what they are off the top of your head, go back, take a look at them. Uh, but we, we definitely want to make sure that they're fresh in our heads. Now, the industrial cities that, that we started out talking about needed workers. And so workers moved there because according to Ravenstein, the primary reason that people are going to voluntarily move is because of economics. So that was one part of what Ravenstein said. Now, things also changed as countries become more developed. So in the United States, in the history of the United States, as we became more developed, we started to see more dual income households. We saw greater gender equality. And really the big transition here is during uh, and immediately after World War II. When men went off to fight at war, uh, we needed workers. And so a lot of women for the very first time came into the workforce and after the war, didn't want to go back to the house. They wanted to stay working. And so we really saw a huge bump in the number of dual income households. And that also kind of centered around the same time that we moved into Rostoy's fifth stage, that age of mass consumption. Uh, and so we're going to continue talking about that throughout the rest of the lecture. But this had a big impact on the cities because we started to see a lot more people with more money start to move out of the city for the first time. And so that was something that, that had a big impact on these cities and, and how they changed over time. Now, as a profession, urban planning hasn't really been around all that long, about 100 years as a formal profession. But to be clear, uh, cities have been designed for thousands of years. Uh, so we, we have to understand that. But as a formal profession, so it's only been around for a short period of time. Now, as an urban planner, there's a lot of different things that uh, you would probably consider. Things like aesthetics, which is going to be like uh, the actual outward appearance, uh, how beautiful it is, things like that. Um, transportation networks, for example. We want to make sure that uh, people are able to get from, uh, well, where they live to where they work and back and forth. And we have to account for how many people are living in that area. So there's, there's a lot going on there. In addition to that, we want to account for public services, which is once again going to be those services provided by the government. Uh, and even at this point, we can mention central place theory because range and threshold would be something that an urban planner would consider. Um, now, typically range and threshold would be the number of people you need to sustain your business. So we're talking about a private industry um, and how far they're willing to travel for that, that good or service. Uh, but at the same time, for an urban planner, you do have to consider how many people, how many kids are going to be going to that school. Um, how many, uh, how far is that fire truck going to have to travel in order to get there before we put out another one uh, or build another fire station, for example. Uh, so this is absolutely something that you would want to consider. And there's many other things, um, which is when we can introduce one of our vocabulary terms, zoning laws, legal restrictions on land use that determine what types of buildings and economic activities are allowed to take place in certain areas. In the United States, areas are most commonly divided into separate zones of residential, retail, and industrial use, and there's a lot of variety within that. But this is important, again, because as an urban planner, 
do people want to live next to industrial areas? Do you want to put residential next to industry? And if not, where then are you going to put industry? Where are you going to put residential? These are all things that as an urban planner you would have to consider. Now, building on what we mentioned with aesthetics and outward appearance of buildings and things like that, there are some architectural traditions that we want to at least mention uh, in the event that, that we see them uh, on the cultural landscape. This is something that would, would help us. The neoclassical tradition uh, was in response to what ended up happening with the Industrial Revolution. We started to see just factories pop up everywhere, very dirty, very noisy, uh, ill-planned. So neoclassical was an attempt to, to try and rectify that. And we'll take a look at an example. Um, the modern tradition was in response to neoclassical because it neoclassical was is very, very beautiful, but it's not incredibly efficient. It takes a lot of time, energy planning, uh, design, things like that. Modern was very, very efficient. And then finally, postmodern uh, was in response to some of the issues of the modern style. So we're going to take a look at each of these. Alrighty, so let's take a look at some examples of these different architectural traditions. And we'll begin with the neoclassical. Uh, just the name itself means that it is a contemporary take on classical architecture. And so this was largely in response to those, uh, to the industrial cities that, that developed, and we wanted to make them more aesthetically pleasing. So uh, one example that I would like you to write down is the City Beautiful movement. And we'll actually see some examples of this uh, in a documentary coming up. But in the image, you can actually see some of the elements of, of neoclassical design. Um, we've got columns, we've got domes, uh, which is just another example of the late neoclassic Baroque period. And as I always say, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. That's a Beauty and the Beast joke. I was really happy when I thought of that. Continuing on, uh, we've got the modern style. And uh, the modern style really was designed in response to neoclassical. Uh, neoclassical was very, very beautiful, but takes a lot of time to design and build. And, and it... It's not going to look like every other place. It's going to be very unique. And so that, that takes some time and energy to do. Modern buildings, not so much. They're very, very efficient. Uh, they start to look very much like one another. Uh, typically are going to have certain elements in common. Going to be very geometric in nature, uh, particularly like squares, especially. Um, we're going to see the same kinds of building materials typically used, glass and steel predominantly. We're going to see concrete used as well. And uh, really, it, it's always kind of reminded me almost of like an operating room, which is uh, very, very clean, very neat, very sterile, but not especially pleasing to look at. It's not especially welcoming. Um, and that's not, you know, a disrespect towards modern styles of architecture um, because it was very efficient and that was in response to the neoclassical period and so that was that was what its focus was and then finally we have the postmodern style which really was an attempt to try and bring together the elements uh, the positives of neoclassical with the positives of the modern movement and what you see in this image this is actually a building that is commonly called the Gherkin in London. Uh, that's the nickname that it has. And uh, it brings together some of the elements of neoclassical in that it's more aesthetically pleasing to look at. Uh, it is unique, but also uh, it's more efficient in, uh, in, in the same vein as the modern movement. So that's what we, we tended to see. Um, we started to see more uh, bright colors kind of brought back into this and incorporated into it. So not every building looks exactly the same, but at the same time, we're still able to efficiently kind of go about handling that. As we transition now, 
Um, we need to mention rural to urban migration. So as we start to to talk about the, the changing dynamics of the cities, uh, this is one contributing factor. And we remember that this is one of Ravenstein's laws of migration. Now, again, when we talk about rural to urban migration, we're largely talking about it in less developed countries, in developing countries, because in MDCs, uh, pretty much everyone has moved to an urban area. So the rural populations are very, very small and are less likely to make a, a big move to an urban area. They tend to be farmers and we need those farmers to support the very large urban population. Um, the rural to urban migration has already happened in other words. But why do we see a lot of people moving from rural to urban areas? And a lot of times this goes back to lecture number one when we talk about the contradiction of the city. A lot of times it is for economic reasons. Once again, one of the things that we talked about with Ravenstein. There tends to be more jobs uh, and thus more opportunities. And we typically see that in big cities because they have more services. More services mean more jobs. And that's once again that central place theory. Um, better wages a lot of times than out in rural areas, but at the same time, just because there are more jobs, just because there are better wages, does that mean that there's enough jobs and money for everyone that is desiring to move to an urban area? And the answer is, overwhelmingly in LDCs, no. And so what we end up starting to see are these squatter settlements emerge, and these are areas in particular in less developed countries. And we're going to be talking about this more extensively as we get into our final lecture from this unit. So kind of hold on to that. Now shifting in gears a little bit um, into modes of transportation. And at this point, we want to talk about uh, the different ways that people can get around in an urban area. Obviously, we have that things like cars, buses, trains, subways, things like that. Um, the question that I want to ask you on this slide is which one is dominant here in the United States and has that affected the layout of U.S. cities? So obviously what we're going to see is that uh, in the United States we are predominantly driven by private motor vehicle uh, cars. But how would our cities look if most people got around by buses, if most people got around by trains, if most people got around by subways? How would that affect the layout of our cities and subsequently things like services, all these different types of things? So try to imagine that. It's really more of a rhetorical question, but it is something that is important to kind of ponder because... As our populations continue to grow and as more people want to have their own private motor vehicle, um, is that sustainable? And so we have to kind of wonder what might there be in the future. Now, back to the original question, which was, you know, what do we drive cars and has it affected the layout of the city? And the answer is yes, because we have started to see more and more people move out to the suburbs. And one very big element of this was the interstate highway system, which is one of our vocab words, and here's the definition. Begun in the 1950s and funded largely by the federal, that's U.S., government, it created large, limited-access superhighways. Limited access meaning that it doesn't stop at every street. Um, instead, you have limited access connected cities and made it easier for people to live further away from cities. So here's what we're looking at when we talk about the interstate highway system that was begun in the 1950s and now is a very important, uh, I would even say essential part of daily living for many Americans. I, I would probably even go so far as to say most Americans, is that if you took this interstate highway system out, I don't know that people would be getting to, to work in the same fashion. I don't know that cities would look the same way. It would look dramatically different if not for this interstate highway system. So a couple components that we need to, to be aware of. It took years and years for this to be built. But essentially, the we have a grid-like network. I know it doesn't really seem that way, but we do. It's a grid-like network. And the highways that run east to west 
are going to be numbered in with even numbers. And the highways that run north and south are going to be numbered with odd numbers. So the one big one for us when we look at Las Vegas is I-15, Interstate 15. And it runs predominantly north and south. You can see it running there from San Diego up through Las Vegas, through Utah, Salt Lake City, all the way up through Idaho and Montana. And so runs predominantly north and south, therefore it's going to be numbered with an odd number, 15. Now that we've talked about the interstate highway system, let's go ahead and talk about one of the models that focuses on interstate and really, if we wanted to apply it at a different scale, international travel. So that's the operative word, interstate. Circle it, underline it, highlight it, something. That's the important part, interstate, between states. And this is Boschert's model. Now, what this model focuses on is how we got between two different areas. So we start out with the sail wagon epoch. And obviously when we take a look at this one, uh, it's going to be boats and wagons, really. Um, so areas were fairly isolated. As we progress out of that, we get into the Iron Horse Epoch. Now, let me go ahead and ask you, what do you think that Iron Horse is? And take a look at the time frame. What's happening at that same time? Obviously, we see that this is happening during the Industrial Revolution. We know that we've got steam engines, so the Iron Horse is the train. So we begin with it there, but then we move into the steel rail epoch. And really, the big difference here is how connected these areas are. Uh, by the third epoch, we've got the Transcontinental Railroad. We're much more connected to the point where we are even interdependent. We are dependent on goods and materials coming via train to our area consistently and on a schedule so we can trust it. Finally, and I say finally knowing that there is a fifth one up there, finally is the auto air amenity epoch, which essentially is the epoch that we are in now. But that's because the fifth one that we include up there, the satellite electro, uh, electronic jet propulsion epoch, uh, is not a formal stage of Boschert's model. And so that's important to note. But really we're talking about people flying and driving wherever they want and and doing that as an amenity it's it, it's something that people have the disposable income to do because what stage of roast away are we in the age of mass consumption so we can actually take a look at a couple different visuals on the visual on the left is looking at how long it would take us to get to certain places as of 1800 and then looking at how long it would take us to get to different places by 1830. So obviously we can see that we could get through like part of Michigan into Illinois uh, in about six weeks in 1800. But by 1830, we would be able to get as far west as really part of Wisconsin, but into Minnesota by six weeks. This is a great example of space-time compression. Now, to be clear, the world hasn't been compressed as much as what we're seeing now in this age of globalization and how interconnected we are. But at the same time, this is the beginning. This is how that began. And so this is the starting point of space-time compression, is during the Industrial Revolution, new transportation technology linking us together. And that's important to note. Now, to be clear, this is not a formal model that you may see on the AP exam, but it is important to draw the distinction between Boschert's model and Adam's model. Now, Adam, take a look at the emphasis here, intrastate, or once again, changing the scale, intracity, within a state, within a city, and how we get around. So looking at Adam's model, we've got the walking horse cart era, um, which is going to be just one defining characteristic are much more narrow streets. We don't have cars yet, so at this point, um, we don't have to design wider streets to allow for that. 
As we move into the electric streetcar era, this is the era of mass transit when we've got a lot of people living in cities and so they can get on that electric streetcar, they can get on that trolley and be linked to different areas of the city very, very quickly. They don't necessarily have the disposable income yet to buy a car. That comes in stage three and later stage four. And so in stage three, notice the emphasis here, recreational auto era. We aren't dependent on it. And really, it's only people who have very high incomes, what we would call high SES, socioeconomic status, who can afford it. Everyone else is still using public transportation at this point. It's not until we reach the fourth era, the freeway era. Now take a look at the time frame here. What major world event ended in 1945? World War II. And at this point, we've got people coming back, and this is a huge shift for us here in the United States because it is that at this point that we are shifting from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. And so in terms of production, we have been cranking out all of these tanks and trucks and planes and bullets and all this kind of stuff that we were doing during the wartime. Now it's peacetime. We don't need to do that anymore. So instead, instead of reducing production, we start cranking out cars on huge scales, scales that we've never seen before. That drives the price down and now it is more affordable. And so what we saw immediately after World War II was rapid suburbanization, which is exactly what we see right here. And here's our definition of suburbanization. And this is going to be the movement of upper, upper and middle class people from urban core areas to the surrounding outskirts to escape pollution as well as deteriorating social conditions whether they perceive it or it's an actual deterioration, doesn't really matter. If they perceive it, it's as real in their head as it could ever be. In North America, the process became a mass phenomenon by the second half of the 20th century due to decentralization of cities and automobile dependency. Now, take your pen, pencil, underline North America, because this is the definition for the United States for, more specifically, Anglo-America, the United States and Canada. Because do higher income, upper and middle class people live in the suburbs or peripheral areas in other parts of the world? No. Who is living in those peripheral areas? Because it's not the upper middle class. And so that's a very important distinction to make, that when we talk about suburbanization of upper middle income people moving, it's really only in Anglo-America. Now, we saw the, the development of suburbs, a subsidiary urban area surrounding and connected to a central city. Many are exclusively residential, others have their own commercial centers or shopping malls. That's going to be important here shortly. Really, we saw this develop in the the period after World War II. Now, it is at this point that we have shifted in Rostoy's model into the age of mass consumption, where we're, we're consuming, we're constantly consuming, we're spending money. Um, we saw more gender equality, so we saw more dual income households, so we have more money to spend. In addition to that, because we are shifting from a wartime to a peacetime economy, we're much more efficient in terms of production, which drove prices down on things that in, in previous eras, to use Adam's model, um, in the recreational auto era, we couldn't afford. This drives the price down so that now everyone can afford it. In addition, it's important to note uh, a couple pieces of legislation at this point in time. Uh, one, obviously, we mentioned it earlier, the interstate highway system is incredibly important in suburbanization. But also, the GI Bill which for many veterans coming back from World War II helped them get a college education as well as home loans that allowed them to move out to the suburbs because now they had an education, they were getting more money. Now they had a home loan for perhaps the first time in their lives and could buy that first home. You no longer needed to, to live in perhaps a smaller apartment in the city center. You can move out, you could buy your first car because you had more money. We've got more, we're, we're producing more. It's all connected. And that's what this is, that's in, an incredibly important note to make. 
So as more and more people move out to the suburbs, what begins to develop are edge cities, a key new concept of a modern city. They combine all the functions of a central business district, but are located in the suburbs and provide more jobs than homes. So typically these are going to be uh, both residential and commercial. Uh, and even there's a, a special smaller edge city called a galactic city, which coincidentally is an awesome name for a city. Like if you were living in a city and you're like, oh yes, I live in the galactic city. Um, totally cool, but it's probably less cool by definition. A mini edge city that is connected to another city by beltways or highways. That's the definition, though it sounds so much cooler. And yeah. So as these edge cities continue uh, to develop. Now, typically it start out, starts out as residential, but remember what we talked about in central place theory. As more people move into a settlement, what then develops? More services. So that's what we're talking about when we get down to that, that last full bullet point where we say other industries and businesses develop. Well, central place theory tells us that. And so we're going to see things like shopping malls that's going to have a lot of commercial activity there uh, combined into a relatively small condensed area, high density, high concentration, um, very light manufacturing, uh, if any. And then we're going to see some other specialized industries depending on the demands of the people in, in those particular areas. For example, theme parks here in Las Vegas, two great examples. Uh, relatively recently, we've added two new water parks. We've got Wet n Wild out on the west side, and we've got Calabunga Bay on the east side. Is it any surprise that these two water parks are on completely opposite sides of the city? Think about central place theory. Would they be right next to each other? Range and threshold? Probably not. And so that's something to, to consider. Now, there are a couple different types of edge cities. Really, we just want you to be familiar with these terms, having heard these terms before. Um, so we've got Boombergs. Uh, once again, another really cool name that, by definition, is probably less cool. Uh, cookie cutter suburban communities that have popped up recently. These are areas that grow very, very rapidly. And I would say Henderson is a good example of this. Uh, when you take a look at the houses in Henderson, very much cookie cutter. They all kind of look very, very similar to one another. And we continue to grow very, very rapidly. We are booming, and that's what a Boomberg is. We've got other things like green fields, open areas that are potentially viewed for urban development, so kind of in the planning stages, you know, an area that, that might be viewed in as such. Or uptowns, uptowns being a residential area that is quite literally uptown from the central business district. Now, there is a model built on the the concept of edge cities and galactic cities and this is the galactic city model to be clear our textbook defines it as the peripheral model so make a note between those two points and and say that they they are the exact same thing all right but in the AP Human Geography course outline, it goes by galactic city model. So if I had to say the one that you're probably more likely to see on the AP exam, it's probably the galactic city model. But our textbook uses peripheral model, which then only seeks to confuse us a little bit. So here's the definition. A model of North American urban, er uh, of North American urban areas consisting of an inner city surrounded by large suburban residential and business areas tied together by a beltway or ring road. This was created by Chauncey Harris, and hopefully that last name, Harris, sounds familiar to you. Not because it's a very common last name, but instead because it's the same person who came up with the multiple nuclei model. Remember Harrison Ullman? Here's Harris. So took a look at this and, and developed this after we saw that the central business district wasn't as important, that was multiple nuclei model, but now seeing, oh wow, we're seeing a lot of people move out to the suburbs. Oh wow, look at these galactic cities, these edge cities start to develop. And so we got a new model to represent that. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what the peripheral model looks like. 
So here's the peripheral model. Once again, I'm in love with the way that our textbook visualizes this because we've got the model there on the left, but we've got the, the example city here on the right. Once again, for the city of Las Vegas, what would be our central business district? It would be the strip, right? Now, take a look at the residential surrounding that and all the different other components we see shopping malls develop out there you know uh, a lot of commercial activity things like that but importantly take a look at the ring road that is a defining characteristic of the peripheral model or the galactic city model is the ring road the beltway so go back to the last slide underline beltway or ring road we have to know that and when you think about the city of Las Vegas, now we don't have a single highway that, that links us, but if you were to take a look at a map of Las Vegas, we've got the 215, which runs along the southern part of the city. And then as you get further out west, curves north. Then you've got the 95, which runs essentially north to south but then goes along the east side of the valley. And then you've got the I-15, the Interstate 15, that cuts right through the middle of it, north to south. So you could essentially drive all the way around Las Vegas just on our freeway system. Is that not the same thing as the Galactic City model? We're linked by a beltway and ring road. You could get around our city just like that. And it's probably the fastest and most efficient way to get around our city. So the galactic city model has some really important points that we do see in modern cities, especially in our city, as we continue to suburbanize. Now, as this trend of suburbanization continues, one thing that we without a doubt have to mention is urban sprawl, one of our vocab terms. Unrestricted growth, key part of that, unrestricted growth. In many American urban areas of housing, commercial development, and roads over large expanses of land with little concern for urban planning. Now, one of the biggest concerns, especially here in the United States, is the loss of prime agricultural land as these cities continue to grow. Now, is that a huge concern for us living in Las Vegas? Like, if we continue to grow... Uh, are we cutting out the available land to grow our food? No, not so much. But uh, it would be an interesting case study, and, and we've looked at this in, in, in past classes that I've taught, of the city of Chicago. As the city of Chicago continues to grow, and it's only really growing in one direction because the city itself butts up to Lake Michigan, it continues to grow outward, and you are cutting into some prime agricultural land. And so this is a very real concern uh, for us here in the United States as more and more people want to move out to the suburbs. Now, what one geographer has done is looked at what he calls the urban footprints around the world. Now, a couple different things. Um, first off, we're looking at essentially what would be a core pleth map because we've got different uh, classes here. The red being the United States, yellow is Asia, Latin America is green, Europe is blue, Australia is kind of that bluish green turquoisey color, Africa is black, and then orange is the Middle East. So when we take a look at this, where are the largest urban footprints? The largest cities not in population size necessarily, we're talking right now just in geographic area. And when we look at it, the answer is the United States. You know, for example, New York City, okay, we, we kind of expect it's our largest city and, and we have very large geographic cities, but Atlanta is not one of our largest cities. But Atlanta has about the same geographic area as Tokyo and a huge difference in population. Now, you'll notice there at the bottom, it, it's kind of cut. I had to cut it in half so that we could see uh, the differences there. So it is important to note, though, that Las Vegas and more specifically Henderson have been labeled 
one of the worst cities for urban sprawl in the entire country. We've been actually labeled that on a number of occasions by different geographers. And if you take a look kind of right in the just off center left, you see Phoenix and then directly below Phoenix, you see Las Vegas. And Las Vegas, our urban footprint the size of our city. Now they list the population at about 2 million. Now we've actually taken a look at the population of Las Vegas and it isn't 2 million. So really what they've done is kind of combined all of Clark County into this Las Vegas urban footprint. So really it's actually even worse than that because we have even fewer people in essentially what that, that geographic area is. Now we compare that to just look towards the center of that graphic, uh, New Delhi. 21 million people. They have 10 times as many people in a geographic area that is about the size of, of Las Vegas. Now, not saying that this is necessarily anyone's fault, especially not saying that it's anyone in this class's fault, uh, but it is an interesting question. What does this, how does this affect us here in the United States? How does this affect other cities? You know, you look at the, the population of New Delhi, high, high density, high concentration. How does that impact the people of New Delhi? How are we affected by this? So this isn't intended to be, you know, any kind of better or worse type scenario. We try to avoid those here. But instead, what we do try and tackle are both sides of the issue. So what would be positive and negatives? For us here in Las Vegas, an area that has been labeled a city that has some of the worst urban sprawl in the United States, and then positives and, and, and negatives for people in New Delhi, because we could almost certainly come up with positives and negatives for both. Now, there are other issues with regards to this. You've already started thinking about them. One example uh, of an issue that, that could present itself is when it comes to decision making. Now, this slide looks very, very, uh, should look familiar to you because this is something that we mentioned way back in political geography when it comes to decision making and different levels of government, in this case, local government. And who gets to make the decisions? Because as these urban areas expand, and let's say the city of Las Vegas expands beyond the boundary. The urban area that is Las Vegas expands beyond the boundaries of the formal city of Las Vegas. How does this, how are we affected by this? Because uh, just one example uh, for you, if you were to commit a crime, depending on where you are, there's different agencies that could potentially prosecute you. You could be prosecuted by the city of Las Vegas, you could be prosecuted, obviously, by cities of Henderson or North Las Vegas, things like that. Um, you could be prosecuted by Clark County. And each of these different entities have different laws with different penalties. Now, that's just one example. And that's an example that's a little bit more dear to my heart um, because my father is a lawyer. So I've actually had conversations with him about this. But, you know, start thinking about this beyond just law enforcement, start thinking about this when it comes to schools. Clark County School District is one of the largest school districts in the country. What happens if we start to break these this up as has been proposed? Um, what if we do a Henderson School District? Well, what about some of the areas that write Henderson on their mail, but are outside the actual boundaries of the city of Henderson? Are they part of that? Well, technically, no, they're an unincorporated Clark County. So these are some of the issues as these urban areas continue to grow. Now, this isn't all doom and gloom. I'm not just giving you all these negatives. What are some of the things that have been proposed in response to this? Well, green belts are a way that has attempted to deal with urban sprawl, but this is primarily in Europe. So make that note, green belts associated with Europe. And it's one of our vocab terms, a ring of land maintained as parks, agriculture, other types of open space to limit the sprawl of an urban area. So designed greenery. Now, on the U.S. side, we have 
seen the development of slow growth or sometimes uh, mentioned as smart growth cities. These use mixed land use, so you've got some commercial, some residential instead of having distinctive zones. Um, mixed residential, so we've got you know single family detached homes right next to apartments, right next to duplexes, so mixed residential, not clearly defined boundaries. Um, but there are, in this case, well-defined boundaries, so you can't sprawl beyond that, but not defined in terms of residential. And very walkable communities, so you don't necessarily need a car. You would be able to walk from different places. So now, think about some of the issues of urban sprawl and how slow growth or smart growth cities, uh, as well as green belts, seek to rectify that. So what are the problems, and how do these respond to that? And our final slide for tonight is on new urbanism, which is one of our vocabulary terms and is intended to be a response to urban sprawl and even some of the other issues that might have come up over the course of, of this particular unit. So here we go. Here's our definition. New urbanism is outlined by a group of architects, urban planners, and developers from over 20 countries as an urban design that calls for development urban revitalization and suburban reforms that create, here are the important parts, walkable neighborhoods, emphasis there, walkable neighborhoods with a diversity of housing, different styles of residential housing and jobs. So important to underline those, walkable neighborhoods, diversity of housing and jobs. Now, uh, this is something that I do think is, is likely to be on the AP exam. So let's go ahead and run through the 10 different components that are part of new urbanism. There is actually a charter of new urbanism, a new urbanism Congress. So these are actually laid out in a lot of detail. I'm going to give you just snippets of it from uh, a source called newurbanism.org. So here we go. Starting with walkability. What we mean by that is that most things are going to be within a 10 minute walk of home and work. Uh, and that streets are designed to be pedestrian friendly. So buildings are close to the street. We're going to see tree-lined streets, things like that. Um, areas are interconnected by a street system that is still pedestrian friendly. In addition to that, when we get to mixed use and diversity, by that we mean a mix of shops, offices, apartments, and homes on site. Um, and even changing the scale, mixed use within neighborhoods, within blocks and even within buildings. And then finally, not just uh, in terms of the, the layout and things like that, also diversity of people in the community of different ages, different incomes, different cultures, different races, all vital to new urbanism. Continuing on different housing styles uh, or residential housing. So, you know, single family homes, apartments, duplexes, row houses, all within one particular area instead of those those boundaries, those, those separated areas that we talked about in the models. In terms of quality architecture and urban design, the emphasis is on beauty, aesthetics, human comfort, and creating a sense of place, feeling that you are connected to that area. Uh, continuing on a traditional neighborhood structure, by that we mean, you know, for example, just a couple of the components, a discernible center and edge. So knowing where it begins, knowing where it ends, um, having a public space that is at the center so that it's equally accessible for a variety of different people, um, things like that. When we talk about increased density, uh, obviously that is more self-explanatory because we're going to talk about more buildings, more residences, more shops and services that are also higher concentration, closer together for ease of walking. Uh, when we mention smart transportation, we're talking green transportation. So a network of high quality trains that connect cities, towns, and neighborhoods together. So yeah, things are walkable, but if you need to get to other areas outside the, uh, that particular community, you're able to. Um, sustainability, a minimal environmental impact, but also um, we're going to see energy efficiency, limited use uh, of what they define as finite fuels, um, more local production, more walking, less driving, so all of this comes together. 
Uh, and really, that's what number 10 is all about, is that taken together, these add up to a high quality of life, well worth living, and create places that enrich, uplift, and inspire the human spirit. Again, that's taken directly from New Urbanism. Now, what I would like you guys to answer is this, and I know this has been a very long lecture and we're almost done, but I want you to think, is this, the, the way that we describe this, is this the, uh, this community type, would you like to live there? And then, more importantly, why or why not? And then, continuing on with that, is this realistic? Because a lot of times in asking that question in the past, a lot of students have a particular answer for one and a particular answer for the other. And let's say, for example, if you would like to live in this but don't think it's realistic, why isn't it realistic? If enough people wanted to live in this type of, an, uh, of a community, couldn't it then become realistic if the demand is high enough? But we'll talk about that in class. Thank you very much for your attention tonight, folks. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you in class.